thank you very much for choosing to join me this afternoon. Um, this is the second in our series about senior cats. Uh, last week we talked about some of the uh, changes that happen as our cats get older. This week we're going to start to talk about some of the illnesses that become more common in our older cats and as with other sessions we'll have some time at the end for uh, questions and comments uh, but also if you'd like a PDF copy of the slides that I'm using um, please do feel free to send an email or if you put your email address and request into the chat box I can send you a PDF of the slides I use uh, at the end of the session. So the plan really is to focus on those illnesses that are particularly common in older cats and to talk about exactly how common they are. So how likely it is that if you have an older cat, you might see one or more of these conditions um, and also what sort of signs you can look out for and a little bit of information about the diagnosis and management, but very much a dip into the, uh, dipping our toe into the water as far as those things are concerned, yeah. because each of them obviously um, is a topic in their own right. And some of them have already Already been covered in uh, previous cat cafe, cat cafe sessions. So firstly just a reminder of when we're thinking of our cats as being old. So this slide uh, shows that lovely international cat care chart uh, which I, I have shown to you before which summarizes the different life stages of our cats um, and also the ages of cats that correspond to each of those life stages and then on the very right hand column we've got a human equivalent age and just a reminder that particularly thinking of the older cat we're really thinking of the senior and super senior age categories so cats aged 11 years and over. However, because many of these illnesses can start to creep up in middle age, that mature age category, the seven to 10 year old cat, um, is also important to just look at a little bit more closely to keep an eye out for development of some of these health problems as well. And actually some of the health problems that I will mention can be seen in younger cats than this, although they tend to be more common in older cats. Um, illnesses like diabetes, which is more common in older cats, uh, also can be seen in very young cats indeed. So don't just uh, rule out the possibility of any of these illnesses uh, simply on the basis of age and the fact that I'm talking about them today. So what are some of those common illnesses that uh, are more likely in our older cat? Well, this is a, a list of, of really the major ones from my perspective as a vet. Um, and again, dental disease, you will know as an owner, can strike at any point in life. Um, it tends to be more likely in cats that get older. We, we don't often see problems in very young cats needing dental treatments, but some do, and some of you may have experienced that. Um, but it is a, a, a throughout life uh, sort of problem, whereas other illnesses on this list are almost exclusively only seen in older cats. And a good example of that would be high blood pressure, systemic hypertension, which we talked about a few weeks ago. Um, that actually is very rare in uh, cats under the age of 10. It is pretty much an old cat illness. So let's look at each of these very briefly in turn um, and see what are the key points that are helpful for you as a carer to be aware of, how to spot these illnesses and a little bit about how vets can help cats affected by these illnesses. So firstly, dental disease, I've already said a little bit about this. So it's not just old cats, but it definitely is a common issue in our older cats. Uh, and you may well have had a cat suffering from dental problems and the typical sorts of signs of dental illness, probably not at all a surprise as listed here, but basically they're indications of pain, difficulty eating, uh, discomfort in the cat. So the cat may be, for example, finding it more difficult to eat, uh, perhaps may back off from eating because it remembers that actually eating is very painful. Um, some cats will drool and so you'll see saliva drooling from the mouth um, and that in some cases can be blood stained, which also of course indicates that there is um, an abnormality within the mouth. The saliva should not normally be blood stained. 
and bad breath. So these are the, these are the very common signs of dental disease which we would expect to see and it's worth uh, keeping a lookout for in your cats. And dental disease is definitely in a category of things that we can very much treat and we can uh, potentially cure the problem. Uh, now we don't use the same, uh, same sort of techniques that are used in people in that we don't uh, tend to put fillings in our cat's teeth. We tend to treat diseased teeth by removing them but we can clean the teeth as well and uh, this has to be done of course under an anaesthetic and at that time as well where at all possible it's a, an advantage to take some x-rays of the teeth because that allows you to see below the gum line as well as what's going on above that gum line and to understand if there is disease affecting the roots for example and that can impact on how best to, to treat those dental problems. So it, the downside, if you like, of, of uh, dentistry is that it does need an anaesthetic to be done properly, um, but that does ensure that uh, also we can uh, provide very good pain relief. You can do nerve blocks, which are similar to when we ourselves have dental treatment. So this is not a painful procedure for the cat. Cat is, of course, completely unconscious throughout the procedure as well and importantly we can just completely sort out the problem. Next on the list, uh, chronic kidney disease, and this will be another illness that I'm sure you're very familiar with because it is very, very common, uh, probably affects more than a third of our senior cats and possibly more than half of our super senior cats. The super seniors are those aged 15 years and over. So it really, really very common, sort of one in, one in two, uh, one in three to uh, one in two possibility of your cat, older cat developing kidney problems as they age. And typical signs of kidney disease are often quite uh, gradual and progressive in their nature. So uh, early on, it can be quite hard to spot, but include things like drinking more frequently, drinking a larger volume of water and passing a larger volume of urine per day. So if you are able to monitor your cat's thirst and also if your cat uses a litter box, uh, you may be able to tell, particularly if you have a clumping cat litter that your cat may be going to the litter box more frequently and you may also be able to see that the size of the urine ball uh, created in your litter tray, uh, an indication of the volume of urine passed is increased in your cat as well. Most healthy cats will pass urine about two to three times a day. That's the sort of average uh, frequency of urination. So if your cat you're noticing is perhaps now it's three to four or five times a day, um, then that would be considered abnormal and worth talking to your vets about. Other signs of kidney disease tend to include um, more vague signs of, of what I would call malaise, the cat just not being quite right, perhaps not as enthusiastic about eating, a little bit out of sorts, perhaps a little bit depressed or lethargic, uh, vomiting and nausea and weight loss also quite commonly seen in these patients. And to make a diagnosis of kidney disease, then as a vet, we, we have a suspicion, of course, if a cat comes in with this sort of history history of drinking more uh, and the other signs I've described but to confirm the diagnosis requires us to collect both blood and urine samples and the key things we're looking for here is that the urine is more watery, uh, less concentrated than normal, um, and uh, that the blood contains uh, increased levels of substances normally excreted by the kidneys, things like urea, creatinine and SDMA. And we can then confirm a diagnosis of kidney disease, which, of course, uh, opens up uh, lots of other um, uh, important discussions about further assessments that might be helpful. Um, and as discussed in the, the previous Cat Cafe session. But it does illustrate as well, I think, um, the key value of uh, urine sampling in cats. And this is a uh, kidney disease is a really good example of a disease which we can pick up at an earlier stage by doing health monitoring of cats that uh, still appear to be completely healthy, but we can find abnormalities in that urine sample that uh, lead us to diagnose kidney disease. And we hope that early diagnosis will help us in terms of uh, getting a better treatment out 
outcome. So if you're asked to collect a urine sample from your cat at home, uh, and some of you may well have done this uh, yourselves already, um, I'd just like to say it's not a particularly difficult or challenging thing to do, um, although it may sound a bit daunting for particularly many older cats that don't mind using a litter box uh, and will happily pass urine in a litter tray that contains a non-absorbent cat litter, which can either be these plastic beads, uh, like the cat core uh, example on the left, hand side there or there is also a very sort of a posh version I would say which is a hydrophobic sand so it looks like sand but it's been treated so it repels water and the urine just sort of puddles on top of this sand that's kit for cat is one example of that um, and then we can collect a sample or you can collect a sample rather and bring it into the clinic for testing and that can be really helpful in early diagnosis of kidney disease in particular. Treatment of kidney disease, um, there are a lot of things to consider. And uh, again, just very briefly for today, I will reiterate the sorts of things that I mentioned in the uh, Cat Cafe sessions on this topic earlier this year, which are that firstly, if you can feed your cat a specially designed, what's called a therapeutic renal diet, something like Hills KD or Royal Canin Renal, but there are other brands and other names available as well, um, then that has been proven to be the most effective way of maintaining quality of life and prolonging length of life in a cat with kidney disease. So anything you can do to encourage feeding those specially designed diets that are specifically very low in phosphate, that is the, thought to be the key reason why they're, they're helpful in these cats with kidney disease, you'll be doing a lot to help them. There are other strategies as well that can help to slow progression of disease or we hope helps to slow progression of disease and that includes suppression of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system what's uh, abbreviated to the RAS and I've abbreviated it just to the RAAS on this slide um, and we hope that uh, in those cats with uh, what we would describe as an activated RAS which uh, these are typically cats that are uh, losing too much protein in their urine by suppressing that uh, with uh, various medications, we can help to stabilize their kidney disease and uh, slow progression of disease. And then beyond that, there's lots of supportive treatments, which really depend on the individual cat's issues as to what they need. And that would include things to support appetite, uh, medications that uh, reduce nausea and vomiting, for example, uh, fluids for cats vulnerable to dehydration, a huge number of things. And uh, as I've already mentioned, Mentioned, we spent some time earlier this year in other cat cafe ses sessions talking about CKD and there are th those three recordings are available on the video tutorial page of the website. So if you are interested in learning more about CKD and weren't able to attend those sessions then I'd refer you to those. Also under the helpful info top menu on the website, you can access the, uh, there's a, a very brief feline health blog, which has an article on CKD, which links to all the other resources on the website. So that, that's a good starting point. And uh, I have a book, Caring for a Cat with Chronic Kidney Disease, which is also available in the shop on the website. Um, and that's available as a PDF or as a, a print book. So if this is a topic of interest to you, there are definitely lots of resources on my website site for you. Next on the list was high blood pressure, systemic hypertension, and we're still trying to work out exactly how common this is, but we think probably 20% of our senior and super senior cats overall uh, have high blood pressure. And there's a very definite association with uh, age and increasing age increases the risk of high blood pressure. So in fact, for cats in the super senior age category, it could be 40 or 50% of them uh, that develop high blood pressure. So it's it very much an age related condition. And we also know it's particularly common with some underlying health problems, um, the most common of which are chronic kidney disease, which we've just talked about, where up to 60% of cats with chronic kidney disease develop high blood pressure as a consequence of their kidney disease. And around about 20% uh, of cats with hypothyroidism have high blood pressure. So that's another important situation where uh, looking for and treating high blood pressure is important. 
in its early phases, hypertension is often called a silent killer. And it's called this in people as well as in cats. And that's because it can be impossible from the outside to see the effects of the high blood pressure. But if the high blood pressure continues and if it's uh, sustained at a very high level, it can be incredibly damaging, potentially uh, fatal to our cats. And uh, so signs that you might see in those very severe cases uh, would include damage to the eyesight. So blindness or, or partial loss of sight and bleeding actually into the eye, which you can see in this photo on the slide is uh, an example of where there was bleeding at the front of the eye. So it was it was visible just looking at the cat in a normal sort of way. But if you do see uh, your cat has any difficulty with their eyesight, if they suddenly are bumping into things or seeming uh, not to be able to see properly, this is uh, what I would regard as, as an emergency and uh, prompt treatment. Uh, there is um, at least a reasonable chance that you will be able to save some eyesight. Uh, even those cats actually that have been blind for one or two months, uh, treatment can lead to an improvement in their eyesight eyesight, but the sooner the better in terms of outcome. Diagnosis of hypertension requires access to blood monitoring facilities, which thankfully most vet clinics do have, um, and also looking at the eyes very carefully. And again, this is another topic we, we have spent some time on in previous Cat Cafe sessions. So if you're interested in learning more, there are, there are three uh, sessions on uh, the website on that video tutorial page that you can access and, and have a look at. Next on the hit list, uh, osteoarthritis. Now this is actually um, a, a topic for next time's uh, session. So I'm not gonna say very much about osteoarthritis today, except for that it is very common. There are a couple of radiographic studies. These are studies looking at x-rays of older cats that indicate that more than 90% of senior and super senior cats have evidence of arthritis on an x-ray. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that more than 90% of our senior and super senior cats are in pain due to that arthritis, but it does tell us that those joint changes are common. And of course, for some cats, it can be a source of uh, extreme pain, difficulty moving around, which can really impact on our cat's quality of life. And it's often quite hard to diagnose because any cat that has arthritis, if they are painful or they find it difficult to move around, they tend to just very sensibly not push themselves. And because these changes happen very gradually, it can be quite hard for a carer to spot that perhaps they're previously very active cat now is seemingly spending all their time sleeping on a, a little mat at floor level because it's sore to jump on the sofa. So we'll talk more next week about how we can uh, help to, to spot these cases at an earlier point and also importantly how we can treat them and there's a lot of things that can be done in terms of painkillers but uh, also special diets and environmental support that can make a massive difference to quality of life in affected cats. Next on the list is cognitive dysfunction syndrome or CDS and this is the cat equivalent of Alzheimer's disease and similar to Alzheimer's in people also very common in cats and again like Alzheimer's disease in people the older the cat the higher the likelihood it is to uh, develop this uh, possibility and uh, at a tissue level under the microscope there are there are some similarities with Alzheimer's disease or there are also some differences um, but the the net consequence of, of these changes in the tissues is that our cats may show signs of dementia so they may show forgetfulness they might forget forget where their food or water or their litter tray is. Uh, they may uh, forget um, how to use a litter tray, so show some toileting accidents within the home. Uh, they may seem to um, not really quite understand where they are. So, you know, do that walk into a room and look quite confused about, you know, where they are and what's happening. Um, and they may have uh, alterations in their behavior. So their, their tolerance of other individuals might go down. They may be a little bit grumpier, a little bit more more aggressive or perhaps a little bit more clingy uh, with their carers um, and whilst similar to Alzheimer's there isn't a cure available for feline cognitive dysfunction there is a lot we can do to help affected cats having importantly ruled out other causes of those behavioral changes and we'll talk more about that uh, later this month. 
Next on the list is hypothyroidism and this too is quite a common condition. It affects about 10% of older cats. So it's less common than kidney disease, but common enough that probably many of you will either have cared for a cat with hypothyroidism or know someone who has. Um, and it's typically caused by a benign overgrowth of the thyroid tissue, which produces too much of the thyroid hormones, T3 and T4, and that causes the clinical signs that we see in our cats and I've included some pictures of patients where we have uh, before and after pictures available so these are some before pictures you can see both Anna and Chico looking very thin and that is absolutely typical uh, with hypothyroidism and one of the striking things about hypothyroidism is that uh, the ca affected cats will typically be losing weight in spite of having a very good appetite and often described as you know eating their owner out of all of the the you know the cat food available i've had patients uh presented to me where the owner has taken to sleeping downstairs in the house so they're closer to the kitchen and can feed the cat through the night when it's demanding food and it's perhaps eating you know seven or eight pouches of cat food a day you know huge amounts of food and yet is really really thin so that's really typical for this condition, but there are some other signs to look out for. So often there will be coat changes, uh, gastrointestinal changes, sickness and diarrhea, also often a slight increase in thirst, often not as dramatic as a cat with kidney disease, but maybe enough for you to just notice that your cat is perhaps at the water bowl a little bit more often than would have been normal for them in the past. So to make this uh, diagnosis, um, there are a few things that we as vets will, will do. Firstly, we'll do a physical examination and there are often our clues there. Uh, one of which is that we may be able to feel that the thyroid is enlarged and the thyroid is found in the neck um, just below the, the voice box. And normally we shouldn't be able to feel it. But if when we feel the neck as shown in this top photo, you can feel a lump, then that increases the suspicion of hypothyroidism although we need to confirm the diagnosis uh, by doing blood tests to show that the thyroid hormone levels are increased on, on blood testing. Also on our physical examination we might find that uh, the cat has a very fast heart rate and a heart murmur. Those are extremely common uh, findings as well. So there are uh, very much useful clues that we can get from examining the cat um, and then as we say follow it up with our blood tests to uh, confirm that th we have the diagnosis and often the blood tests give other clues as well. For example the liver values typically are raised in cats with hypothyroidism. The bottom picture shows a cat uh, that's just about to have thyroid surgery and uh, I'll just um, press the next button now. You can see hopefully within that red oval you can actually see the enlarged thyroid. So now that the, the neck area has been clipped and prepared for surgery you can actually see those swellings. So they're typically uh, pea-sized uh, some, but sometimes can be bigger than that. And there are a number of treatment options available for hypothyroidism. There are some that are what we would call reversible, so need to be given forever, otherwise the disease will recur. And that includes antithyroid medications. And also there is one food available, uh, which is made by Hills. It's called YD, and that is a, a iodine restricted food. It has very low levels of iodine. And because iodine is needed to make the thyroid hormones, um, then um, if you just feed this cat and uh, sorry just feed the food and nothing else to the cat um, then that can help to bring the thyroid uh, levels down as well or alternatively there are what we would call curative uh, options so these are the not reversible options uh, surgical removal is one and, and I hope that uh, top picture is uh, is not um, distressing to see it's obviously there's a little bit of blood there but that is what a thyroid typically looks like at surgery so you can see the surgical scissors there and the small thyroid lump to the left and this is usually quite a straightforward surgery although there are some some risks and some uh, complications that are possible 
possible. Um, alternatively, if you have access to radio iodine facilities, then that is a really good treatment for hypothyroidism because it has a 95% cure rate and it is very gentle on every other tissue. So it's very safe for the cat, um, very effective. But the main difficulty with radio iodine is that unfortunately there are not many centers uh, in most countries that um, make it straightforward. You might have to drive for several hours if you're in the UK to actually reach a radio iodine treatment center. But the prognosis, the outcome following treatment is often very good. It does depend on whether the cat, being an older cat, has other issues it has to fight as well. But from a hypothyroidism perspective, often this is a disease that I would say is typically very well manageable. So it, uh, most patients do very well and some will be completely cured. So you saw photos of these, uh, these cats in some of the previous slides. That's their before pictures. Um, and after treatment, you can see just how stunningly fabulous all those cats look uh, and uh, there's the most striking thing is the lovely coats and obviously the weight gain um, and uh, so it, it's often I think a good illness if you've got to get an illness to get because there are good possibilities of successful treatment. Other sources of information on my website on hypothyroidism, well, in, in the Feline Health blog, which is under the helpful info menu, there is some information about hypothyroidism there. And there also is a book, Caring for a Cat with Hypothyroidism, which is available in print and electronic form. Um, and I'm sure we will come back to it in future cat cafes as well. Diabetes, um, diabetes mellitus, I've included it as a common older cat illness um, because it does tend to be more frequently seen in older cats, but it can also definitely be seen in young and middle-aged cats as well. So it's not exclusively an old cat illness in the way that that hypertension is, for example. And it is not as common as some of the other things that we've talked about. So actually for most countries where uh, prevalence studies have been done, it's maybe 1% uh, of the cats that have developed diabetes. So it is less frequently seen than hypothyroidism, for example. Major risk factor for obesity in cats, as is the case in people, is obesity. So it is something that we have seen an increased frequency of in recent years. There also are some uh, breeds that are more vulnerable to uh, development of diabetes and Burmese cats are, are the classic for that, particularly certain lines of Burmese cats uh, in uh, Australia, New Zealand have uh, you know, really high predisposition to diabetes. So if you do have a Burmese cat, it, it, there is even more reason and to try and maintain a healthy weight in that cat because they there certainly some lines uh, do have an increased vulnerability to diabetes and the typical signs that you might see in a cat with diabetes are that the, they are very very thirsty so often the increase in thirst is quite dramatic so uh, we're not just talking about the cat perhaps uh, visiting the water bowl a little more often and drinking a little bit more. Um, they, these are cats that will empty their water bowl and you will have to fill the water bowl, you know, maybe two or three times a day and also therefore passing large volumes of urine. So a dramatic, typically dramatic increase in thirst, but the cats often other than that are quite cheerful. As with a hypothyroid cat, they typically have a good appetite. Sometimes uh, they're hungrier than normal, but similar to the hypothyroid cats, they're often losing weight. So that weight loss in spite of a good appetite, uh, these are definitely two conditions on, on the list of possibilities to consider. In the long term, there are some uh, potential uh, health complications that we see less often. One would be uh, the example I've shown on the slide here of what we call a, a peripheral neuropathy. This is damage to, uh, in particular, long nerves going to the back legs and uh, sometimes the front legs can be um, harmed by this poorly controlled diabetic state. And as a consequence of that, we can get this uh, unusual uh, what we call a plantigrade stance where the cat you can see is half of the back leg is is on the table the cat actually can't stand up fully on the toes because of this nerve problem and that can therefore give them a very unusual gait a very unusual way of walking um, and can be quite a striking thing for a carer to see so again if you see your cat's either sinking down on its back legs or sinking down on its front legs this would be one thing to consider 
it can improve with treatment of the diabetes but also in many cases it it's, can be the, uh, the sort of thing that remains long term. In terms of diagnosis of diabetes, this is another illness where we need both blood and urine to complete our picture. And typically in our blood sample, we see a very high blood glucose because these cats either have a deficiency of insulin uh, or the insulin is not able to work effectively, which what, what we call insulin resistance uh, or indeed a combination of the two so reduced insulin levels and reduced responsiveness to insulin and that means that glucose blood sugar can't move into cells because it needs insulin to help it move into the cells so if the insulin isn't there or isn't able to work then the levels of glucose in the circulation stay high and the consequence of that is firstly that glucose can't be used as an energy source the cat has to use other energy sources which is why they lose weight but also the glucose the high glucose levels um, pass into the urine and the kidney would normally um, I'm going to anthropomorphize here but the kidney would normally hold in the glucose in the body but uh, above a certain point it just can't do that so the glucose goes into the urine and wherever glucose goes it takes water which means that then the cat is producing a large volume of urine because of this glucose there and that's why they have to drink a lot otherwise they become dehydrated Treatment of diabetes can be very effective in cats. Uh, insulin is usually required as part of that treatment, but special diets that are low in carbohydrate are also very helpful. And the pictures here show firstly a glucometer blood glucose meter at the top, uh, which uh, shows a very high reading of 15 millimoles per litre. Normal blood glucose for a cat is uh, often about five millimoles per litre. So you can see much, much higher level. And that dipstick, uh, you can see that the tab at the bottom of that picture uh, that I'm holding is very brown in colour because it has lots of glucose in it. It should be a nice pale green colour. So just illustrating the ways that we can do some of these tests in our clinics. Final one to just very briefly mention is constipation which is very common in older cats and uh, often in cats with kidney disease as well because they tend to be what I would say running a bit dry a little bit marginally dehydrated so their their feces therefore become a bit dehydrated drier harder to pass and so again if you're able to see what your cat is passing in a litter box uh, and really keep an eye on that particularly for the older cat it's helpful most healthy cats will pass feces once a day that is typical that's average um, of course like people there there's always a little bit of variation but for most cats it's once a day so if your cat uses a litter box and it's only passing feces every two or three days that might indicate that they are having some difficulty and even if things haven't completely stopped coming out they might benefit from help and there are lots of things that that we can do to help uh, to soften the, the feces and, and support their, their, them being passed as well as of course things that we can do to encourage water intake that can help as well um, and that was something that we talked about in the, the last series uh, related to lower urinary tract disease. So there is plenty that can be done but if you see your cat straining or having difficulty um, uh, or you know that they're just passing less feces than normal then talk to your vet about it because there's, there's plenty that can be done. So in summary, there are a number of, I think, very important causes of illness in older cats. And the key message is that there's, there's plenty we can do to help cats that have all of these conditions, even the incurable conditions. There is a lot we can do to really vastly improve quality of life and sometimes slow the progression of disease as well. So um, even if your cat has arthritis, we can't do joint replacements or multiple joints but we can really help their quality of life and I'll tell you more about that next week. So uh, my key message would be to always keep in good contact with your vet clinic and talk to them about changes you see in your cats and any concerns that you have and uh, I've given a summary here of the um, approximate prevalence of these conditions so uh, how frequently we see them in older cats um, and the senior cat as a reminder is a cat aged 11 and over so you can see osteoarthritis well that again is based on the x-ray studies uh, almost every older cat um, but don't panic if you think your cat is still leaping through the trees um, and it's it's you know not showing signs of mobility problems then then you know everything is okay even if it has some x-ray changes 
um, but we're obviously going to focus next week on how we can pick up the cats that do have some signs of pain and help them accordingly. But you can see if you if you do have a cat for a number of years and it reaches that senior age group, you're very likely that it will at some point or other develop one or more of these conditions. And uh, as I say, the key thing is not to worry about that because there is lots that can be done to support the cat uh, with whatever of these and even in combination as well uh, that might develop. Other resources on the website, um, there is a book, Caring for an Elderly Cat, which was written by myself and Vicky Halls as a bit of a manual of care for older cats, and that might be of interest. Um, and a reminder about uh, referral services and, and all those other videos that we mentioned during the presentation. So uh, hopefully there's plenty there to, to really answer your questions, but also we're going to have uh, questions just now. And before I open the floor to questions, uh, just a reminder that next week we're talking about arthritis support in older cats so I hope as many of you as possible will be able to join me for that session. Thank you very much.